your keynote speaker for this evening. Uh, he is a barrister from Melbourne uh, who's traveled to Perth, especially to speak with us tonight. He's won many awards for his work, including an Order of Australia in 2009 for his human rights advocacy, especially for refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, his wife, Kate, set up spare rooms for refugees to provide practical support to people coming out of detention centers, and they've opened up their own home to refugees since 2002. Please join me in welcome right now, in welcoming right now to Perth, the keynote speaker, Julian Burnside. Um, what, what an act to follow. I mean, <laughs> especially finishing with bloody suicide. Yes. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, um, I, uh, I, I thought I'd start by explaining why I'm actually here tonight. Uh, and why I'm speaking at a Greens function. Uh, I've never before have I ever shown <coughs> public support for any political party. Uh, in fact, I've never even been interested in politics, and I'm still not very much. Um, but this year, um, for the first time, I've decided to come out and publicly support the Greens for one reason. What is going on in this country at the moment is without prison. This is the first election campaign in Australia's political history where both the major parties are trying to outbid each other in their promises to be cruel to a selected group of human beings. It's a disgraceful position that we've come to, and the only uh, uh, non-trivial party who have a decent policy for dealing with refugees is the Greens. And that's why I've been to various states speaking in support of uh, Greens candidates. And if you take nothing else away from uh, uh, my talk tonight, because your ears are still beginning with suicide bombers, and <laughs> uh, at least do this. Make sure that Scott Ludlam is re-elected to the Senate. Because... <laughs> exactly how we've got to this. Now, you know, Sammy made, made a really good point about, no, don't come back. You, you <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he made a very good point uh, about, you know, how, how, how can you <coughs> not swear to Mr. Kangaroo, you know, a bit terrible thing to, to crash into the national anthem. We're a very complicated people, you understand. I mean, we are, you, you probably have not yet come to grips with the complexities. Two years will not be enough to come to grips with the complexities. You pointed to that verse in the of the line in the second verse of the national anthem. You know, how could we have a national anthem that says, for those who come across the sea, we've boundless plans to share. But if people do turn up, we want to push them back, spend zillions of dollars trying to keep them in misery, and uh, reject every possibility of them doing what they can do to contribute to the country. In addition, we are the only country in the world that eats both of the animals on its national <laughs> there's, there's, there's a world reading. Um, and, and by the way, and that's not the only contradiction, I mean, we are paralysed with anxiety about terrorism. The Australian anti-terror laws introduced in the wake of uh, September 11 are, are arguably the harshest in the world. And yet there's one great national hero, at least in Victoria national hero. Have you heard about Ned Kelly? <laughs> yeah, okay. Ned Kelly. But I mean, in Victoria we reckon it's pretty important. Ned Kelly, by contemporary standards, was a terrorist. You've all heard of the Eureka Stockade. The Eureka Uprising was a terrorist uprising, then and now. By any legal standard, it was a terrorist uprising. And we all think it's fantastic. But how is it that we manage to hold these contradictory ideas in our heads? How is it that we can be a nation which has grown prosperous on the back of uh, uh, people who've come here from other countries, and yet reject people who come here from other countries as if somehow they don't fit in? It's bizarre. One of the most famous um, I, I hate to use the word Q-jumpers because it is a lie for the reasons Sammy had said. Um, but there's a very famous Q-jumper in our history. He was a guy who came from England uh, in 1914. He jumped ship in Melbourne, uh, stayed without permission, signed up in the uh, uh, Australian Army, went across with the Australian Army to Gallipoli, and with his donkey became quite famous because he rescued a number of Australian wounded soldiers. Simpson, and his donkey Simpson arrived here as Fitzgerald and arrived here without permission and uh, eventually became very famous. These are facts of our history that people need to remember because 
our history is not a simple one, and frankly, if we think that the simplistic answers being given by the major parties will work, we're, we're, we're just wrong. So what is going on right at the moment? Um, I think it's important to know why we've got to the stage that both major parties can actually get votes by promising to outdo each other in their cruelty to a group of human beings. I mean, if they were promising to be cruel to animals, it probably wouldn't work for them. If they were promising to be, you know, to kill every kangaroo they came across, it wouldn't work. Um, if they were promising to be cruel to Jews or to carpenters or to tall people, it wouldn't work. Why is it that they can promise to be cruel to refugees and somehow that's working electorally for them? Well, it's worked because, to their eternal disgrace, the coalition in 2001 started calling both people illegals with the immediate implication that they have broken the law. It started calling them queue jumpers with the implication that they've done something which is morally improper. As if, when you're running for your life, the etiquette of the Coles checkout queue applies equally. Um, as if, I, I, I sometimes like to fantasize about some very punctilious Cesar from Afghanistan who's fled across into um, Quetta, but then decides that he wants to escape to safety and to do it the way that Tony Abbott would approve. And so, being a punctilious man, he uh, looks for the Australian Embassy in Kabul. The way to find him, of course, is to go to the DFAT website. Do it, do it tomorrow, it's quite interesting. You go to the DFAT website, look for the address of the Australian Embassy in Kabul, and you'll find that they tell you it is, its location is a secret for security reasons. Mm. Well, how the hell are you meant to queue up when you're not able to open up where the queue is? It's ludicrous. When you're running for your life, there isn't a queue. It's simply false. It's a, it's a dishonest way of persuading the public that these are people who, in some way, should be rejected. They lied when they said that they had a, a group of them had thrown their children overboard. It turned out to be false. All of these lies have been done with a very specific purpose. And the purpose has been to make Australians generally fearful of both people. Make us hate them and fear them. So that then they become an easy target. Because you can't promise to mistreat people and get popular by doing it unless first of all you've made the public hate them. And that is what the coalition have done. And to their discredit, the Labour Party have done nothing to contradict it. Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard both had a perfect opportunity to say, all of that's false, you've been misled, they've lied to you, these people haven't broken the law, they are not a threat to us, they're not invading us. What about Scott Morrison recently? Scott Morrison recently said that uh, asylum seekers who are going to be accommodated or detained in the community should be placed somewhere not close to vulnerable people. Now, what, what suggestion does that carry with us? Uh, the latest in the bidding war between the parties is that the coalition will bring in the military to deal with both people. Again, creating the suggestion that they are in some way a threat. They stopped talking about uh, border control and started talking about border protection, as if we need to be protected from both people, when the truth is they need to be protected from their persecutors. It makes all the difference in the world. When someone washes up on our shores asking for protection, it makes all the difference in the world when you realise these are terrified, defenceless people who are asking for our help. And it disgraces our national character when we treat them as if they're criminals, people who need to be mistreated, and the party that mistreats them the most will get the largest votes. Um, the fact is, that what we're doing with refugees at the moment is costing a fortune. Now, I assume everyone in this room pays tax, more or less. Um, your money is being wasted on the mistreatment of refugees. Uh, the Greens recently got some figures from the Parliamentary Library, which show that if they adopted, if the, if the government uh, abandoned the idea of detention in remote and offshore places, abandoned the idea of using Papua New Guinea and Nauru as places, of detention to warehouse people who come here, we could save more than three billion dollars. Three billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, the, the, the numbers I think are a bit conservative because they probably don't, they, in fact they don't take into account the foreign aid component, which is a disguise for foreign aid which has been dumped on Nauru and Papua New Guinea in order to persuade them to go along with our plan. That foreign aid money hasn't been counted. 
My estimate is that it's around about $3 billion a year they spent mistreating refugees. Now, um, there is an alternative plan, um, most of which the Greens support, and I'm trying to nudge them into supporting the last bit of it. <laughs> I'm not their spokesperson, but Scott will tell you all about it. The plan, the plan is this. And I, I would ask you to reflect on this and maybe to consider <coughs> fine-tuning. Try and consider what would be wrong with it. Try and consider the benefits of it. Here's the idea. Uh, when people come to Australia without an invitation, I accept that it is reasonable to detain them initially. We do not suggest an open doors policy. I've never suggested an open doors policy. But initial detention should be capped at one month, unless a court is persuaded that longer detention is needed in a particular case. That month would be used for preliminary health and security checks. They would then be released into the community on a number of conditions. They would have a, a bridging visa pending refugee status determination. The uh, conditions would include, first, that they are allowed to work. The fact that people are released into the community at the moment, not allowed to work, and work is defined as including voluntary work, so they're not even allowed the dignity of doing something useful without pay. Um, so, first, they would be allowed to work. Second, they would be allowed access to Centrelink uh, and Medicare benefits. Third, they would have to uh, maintain regular contact with the department so that they remain available for the balance of their process, so that they can be given a permanent visa or removed from the country, depending on which way it goes. And finally, and this is the bit which I think the Greens haven't yet quite embraced, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, it, which is that uh, pending refugee status determination, they would be required to live in specified rural or regional areas. The point of that is pretty straightforward. Um, if every single one of them remained on benefits, and that's highly unlikely, but let's suppose every single one of them did, it would cost uh, if you add on something for administrative costs, say add 50% for admin costs, it would cost about $30,000 per person per year for those people to remain in the community on social security benefits. At the moment, we're spending around about $300,000 per person per year, so there's a big saving there. Um, and of course, that money would go into country towns that are presently shrinking quietly as their populations fall. There's unused housing stock in country areas. I think, now, I mean, let's suppose the previous year's intake continued, which is unlikely. 25,000 people arrived by boat last year, 12 months to 30th of June. Um, let's suppose that continued. How many people live in country Australia? Two and a half million. So that's one refugee per 1,000 head of population. I don't think even the Murdoch press would describe that as an invasion. <laughs> I suspect that most towns would be quite keen to get an injection of money and population they had the chance. But let's suppose only one in five towns are interested or appropriate. That would mean five refugees per thousand head population. Still well short of an invasion, still perfectly manageable according to the Australian character as I understand it. And the, I, I think if we did something like this, you would find country towns um, bidding against each other for the next batch of boat people. In fact, you'll, you'll, have, you'll, have, you'll have country towns wanting to jump the queue to get more money. <laughs> that would be weird. Um, now, why? the question is whether this is a feasible, is a feasible option. So, what are the facts at the moment? Well, the facts at the moment, as you all know, is that they don't break the law by coming here. They come in very modest numbers. The numbers, historically, have averaged out at about 1,000 people per year. In the last 12 months, the numbers rose fairly steeply because international refugee movements rose quite substantially. And if you track our boat people intake over the last 15 or 20 years, it tracks parallel to international refugee movements. Um, is 25,000 a year too many for us? Well, we managed it before. Some of you will remember, I've addressed myself to the elders in the room, at the end of the... At the, end of the um, Vietnam War. Um, uh, Malcolm Fraser, to his credit, managed pers to persuade Gough Whitlam to make common cause on the idea of a refugee processing arrangement in Malaysia, which was close to the source of the refugees, and they were offered swift and safe resettlement. 
And we received about 25,000 Indo-Chinese boat people each year for the last few years of the 70s with no social disruption at all. Our population was smaller, the country was smaller, our economy was more fragile and was smaller. We managed it then. Why can't we manage it now? The only reason that it's difficult and divisive now is because the coalition have been sufficiently miserable to make a political issue about it and sufficiently dishonest to pick on a group of people who they have maligned as illegals. By the way, Caitlin might be saying this, but I think you need to know, if you're interested in language, the word illegal used as a noun in reference to asylum seekers has a very tawdry history. It was first used that way in the 1930s in reference to Jews fleeing Germany. That's where the word illegals comes from. And Tony Abbott has revived it. Scott Morrison keeps on throwing it around, and they both should be ashamed of themselves. Not only <laughs> they should be ashamed not only because it's dishonest, but because it degrades the character of this nation. This country is better than either of our major parties give us credit for. I do not think it is part of the Australian character to be cruel to defenceless people. I do not think it's part of the Australian character to think it desirable to waste billions of taxpayers' money being unpleasant to a group of people doing nothing worse than looking for a place to be safe. Now reflect on this. Most of the boat people who've arrived in the last 15 or so years have come from that corner of the world which is uh, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and more recently some people coming from Sri Lanka. Uh, th those people, uh, the pathway to Australia, and Australia is the cheapest destination by the way, it's cheaper than getting to Europe, cheaper than getting to America, the pathway takes you down through Malaysia to Indonesia, and from Indonesia uh, you get on a boat if you can find one and try to make your way here. Now, why do they do that? It's very dangerous. We know it's very dangerous, and we know that people will drown uh, making the attempt. The reason they do it is this. Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, none of those countries have signed the Refugees Convention. So they can pass through, but they can't stay. And if they, once they get to Indonesia, they face this fact, that if they are found by the Indonesian authorities, they will be thrown in jail. They cannot work they'll be found and thrown in jail. They can't send the kids to school because they'll be found and thrown in jail. They can wait in the shadows in the hope of being resettled because some country might put up its hand and say, we'll take a batch of your uh, asylum seekers who are waiting there. But the wait will be between 15 and 30 years. Now I invite all of you to place yourselves mentally in the shoes of those people. You've escaped the Taliban or you've escaped Saddam Hussein, or you've escaped the mad religious zealots that run Iran. You've fled the way down, you're in Indonesia, and you've got a choice. You can wait for 15, 20, 30 years until some country offers to take you, or you can take your courage in both hands and jump on a boat in an attempt to get to safety. Will anyone in this room say that they would wait? Is there anyone who wouldn't try and get on a boat to get to safety? I've never met any Australian who said that they would do anything different than what the boat people do. So why is it that we think it's all right to mistreat them for doing what we would do if we had the misfortune to be in their shoes? One thing that the great failing in Australian politics at the moment is that neither of the major parties is willing to stand up and be honest about what's going on and recognise the fact that these people are not a threat to us. They are, in fact, an opportunity for us to show what we are like. Unfortunately, what we're showing we're like is fairly wretched. You know, we think of ourselves as warm, generous, welcoming people who believe in the idea of a fair go. But overseas, we are seen as selfish, greedy and cruel. Our national character is being stolen from us by politicians who want to steal your votes so that they can so that they can implement policies that they have sold dishonestly to a community who have trusted them. That's where politics are from. My alternative is 
spin, which I think is dazzlingly good. <laughs> um, it has a couple of benefits. First, it will, it will benefit the towns where people live pending refugee status determination. And let's remember, 90% of both people ultimately are assessed by us as genuine refugees entitled to our protection. So most of them are going to make the grade. We might as well not damage them on the way through. Um, but they will, their, their presence in those towns will benefit the economy of those towns for as long as they stay. And with a bit of luck, the real Australian character will come through and the towns will welcome them and they'll want to stay on <coughs> once they get refugee status and they're no longer required by a visa condition to remain there. Um, second, it'll liberate about two and a half billion dollars a year out of the budget. Now, uh, there's a few ways you can use that. I mean, one way is over the next few years you could actually cancel every hex debt in the country. I think there are some people who will do that. <laughs> but uh, uh, only younger people clap them. <laughs> um, another possibility is this. Why don't we take a billion a year that we're saving and spend it building public housing for homeless Australians? Yeah. What about taking another billion a year that we've saved and using that for national infrastructure projects? It would be great for the economy, it would be great for the fabric of the country, and it would also, interestingly, provide employment opportunities for the very boat people who we're accommodating. Um, we've then still got a half billion left over, and well, we could give that to Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> they love it, they love it. <laughs> it occurred to me a while ago that, that another radical alternative policy, uh, don't take this seriously please. <laughs> <laughs> a radical alternative policy would be to say, well, you know, if we're so obsessed with that boat people, if we really think they have to stay in detention, pending refugee status determination, what about declaring the island of Tasmania to be a place of detention? There is a precedent for it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they could all live in the community there, but they'll be in detention. Uh, and, and it's difficult for them to leave. All you need to do is keep an eye on the airport. And um, there you are. They'll all be, they'll all be safe. They'll all be happy. They'll all, and you'd save a huge amount of money. And what we could do is give the government of Tasmania a billion dollars a year at, in return for the favour. And I think that's for it. <laughs> never forget that. The Scott Morrison will dearly love you to forget that these are human beings. And one of the odd things about the thinking about human rights in Australia is, is this. We tend to forget what human rights are and what they mean because most people in Australia's human rights are at risk. You know, most of us in this room, I imagine our human rights are pretty safe. Uh, I think uh, there are some who may remember times when their human rights were not safe. But it's really at the margins that you find people's human rights being uh, challenged, jeopardised or ignored. And if you're a member of uh, a fringe group, if you are politically irrelevant, if you are weak and powerless, then your human rights are more likely at risk. That 5% around the edges, that's where you see human rights being trashed. And there's a curious thing, because most Australians, if you ask them, would say they think human rights are important. And yet, they watched with unconcern as David Hicks was held in detention in dreadful circumstances without charge, without trial for five years by our ally, the United States. People watched with unconcern for years as men, women and especially children were held in awful conditions in immigration detention centres um, in, in, in ways that would be unthinkable for the rest of us. And yet the public didn't get concerned. And here's the problem. A lot of Australians think <coughs> that when they say human rights are important, they really mean their own human rights and the human rights of their friends and neighbours and family. But if it comes to a group that they hate or fear, well, maybe their human rights don't matter quite as much. That's incredibly dangerous thinking. 
the important thing to remember, and the Greens will tell you this, that you have human rights not because you're white or Christian or pleasant or rich, but because you're human. And refugees are not only human, just like the rest of us. They are, they are uh, people who've got the initiative and the courage to do things that take great bravery. These are exactly the sort of people who are likely to contribute a valuable amount to our community if only we'll give them the chance instead of trying to beat them up and destroy them before they ever get the chance to live in the community. Um, I, 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 I don't know how to wind up, but what's it, I'll tell you a terrorist joke. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, can, I, can I tell you? Um, I suppose this is my way of saying I'm sincere. Uh, I paid my own way to come across here tonight. I'm doing this in my own time. I'm doing it out of keeping with my past and history. I'm doing it because I believe passionately that what Australia is doing at the moment to both people is profoundly wrong. It is not what Australia is about. There is only one party that is actually going to help turn the thing around if there's any chance of turning it around. What is at stake is nothing less than the character of this country. I really hope that after the next election, whoever wins, whoever wins government will not control the Senate. Let us, for goodness sake, make sure that in the Senate uh, we have the Greens who can stand between uh, the governing party, whichever it is, and their worst desires. Because, candidly, I want to save this country's character for the future. And I hope all of you do as well. As Julian Burns said, everyone, um, I took the last. Now we're going to have a panel discussion, um, and on that panel we have uh, this an esteemed series of guests. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to all of them right now. Uh, all the way over there is Phil Chilton, uh, who's been an activist and advocate for refugees through the Refugee Rights Action Network for over a decade. He's also involved with the National Tertiary Education Union. Uh, so please give him a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome uh, Mary Ann Kenny, who is currently the Director for the Centre of Human Rights Education, Curtin University. Uh, prior to her position at Curtin University, she was at the School of Law, Murdoch University, where she taught migration and refugee law. She is a member of the Ministerial Advisory Body on Refugee Issues, and is also on the Oversight Committee for the Regional Processing Centre on Nauru, where she has visited twice a year, uh, twice this year, sorry. As well as an academic, she's a lawyer and registered migration agent. Uh, we also have Rosemary Hudson Miller, who is the Associate General Secretary for Justice and Mission of the United Church Synod in WA. Uh, she has been a prominent refugee advocate for a decade, starting her advocacy for the marginalized and oppressed in nursing and youth work. In March 2006, Rosemary was presented the Premier's Multicultural Ambassador Award for demonstrated excellence and innovation in providing leadership in promoting multiculturalism and advancing human rights and anti-racism in our community. Um, and finally, with us tonight, we have uh, Scott Ludlam, uh, who is, of course, as you know, one of our Australian Green Senators from WA, is an immigrant from New Zealand. He's also... <laughs> He's also a Welcome to Australia Ambassador and believes that unless we open our hearts and minds to the community, to the common humanity of those who seek a new life in Australia, we place our own humanity in danger. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're back. who are outside the 
the mainstream political space is actually very important and I do want to acknowledge that it's a very big step to just come out and do what you've just done. Uh, we appreciate it a great deal. Some of the times, actually nearly all of the time, what happens to us in the Australian Greens, that we work with a wide variety of people throughout the community, different stakeholder networks, across all these portfolios. What we find happens right before an election is that suddenly we're standing there by ourselves. And everybody has taken a discreet step backwards and we're there by ourselves and all our allies have disappeared. Uh, big business is pretty happy to stump up and pay for Tony Abbott's campaign for him. The trade unions, uh, by and large, less than they used to, but by and large, uh, line up behind the Labor Party. And our allies take a discreet step outside the spotlight because, oh, we can't be too political. Uh, this election's been different. What the NTEU have done has been really important for us. And uh, Julian, what you've just done is very important for us as well. Um, the forum tonight, we, we proposed to discuss the, the idea of something that was safe, effective and legal. And if you're here, you're probably here because you despair and you've had an absolute gut full of the way this debate is being conducted and things that are being said in our name that you basically don't believe in. So mostly what we wanted to talk about was, well, what the hell should we be doing instead? And the thing is, I don't have a three-word slogan. Actually, I do. Say effective legal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit scary. But it did, take, it did take a little while to explain it. It's not something that you can stick on a bumper sticker and that it will automatically work in a way that Stop the Boats automatically works. But it does appeal not just to our better nature as Australians, but it appeals to rationality, to a policy that works, to a policy that's a lot cheaper than locking people up. Who's been out to one of these detention centres and seen them close up from the inside? Um, that's something I really recommend. It kind of changed my life. Going to Port Hedland when it was still open, uh, went up with the RAN, uh, with the RAN crew and arrived there. Uh, it's this busload of activists from down south that arrived in Port Hedland and the people who had been interned and detained in there, men, women and children, had been cooking all afternoon and sealing this gorgeous food in these plastic containers tie them up in plastic bags, then they threw them over the razor wire because if you have guests, you feed them. That was my first introduction to these people about six feet behind this palisade fence laced with razor wire and cameras and an Australian flag somewhere off in the background uh, was that they'd made us dinner. Human beings, that is all. So the policy that we developed didn't kind of fall out of the air haven't thought hard about the regional thing, so give me a second on that one. The whole Tassie thing we might have to take off the table. <laughs> you break that to Christine, I'm not taking it. <laughs> uh, but the idea is that, the, if you will, the one political point of agreement, and they're pretty hard to find, the one point of agreement across the board is that we don't want to see people dying at sea. So what do you do? Julian didn't put it this way, but actually he smashed the people smugglers business model. Did you notice how subtly he did that? He totally took off the table the necessity for people to climb on these boats, give them a safe pathway. That's the essence of what we're on about here. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks so much, Julian. And it's been great to to have you here this evening. I, I feel a, a bit uh, at a loss as being uh, sitting here as a member of the Uniting Church when uh, the leaders of the two uh, older parties are espousing their Christian values. And I, I just want to say I don't believe they are Christian values. The Christian Gospel, the Old Testament, the Testament is founded on a welcome to the stranger, the sojourner, the, the person who is not, who is who is not of your place. It's it's a foundation uh, theology of the gospel, and if you do not understand this, you do not understand the Christian faith. If you do not live it out, you are not living the Christian faith, and that is that is a message that I think is worth us saying. And it's also something that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the person who is most held in, in high esteem and referred to by Kevin Rudd, lived his, his life and suffered his death because of those kinds of values. The way human beings were being treated meant that he had to put himself in harm's way in order to stop that treatment. 
And I think that um, the United Church's position on all, of, on all of this is actually, it's a bit more radical than the Greens' position, I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> At the last uh, synod of the, of, in Western Australia, I put up a proposal that was, um, sh we should increase our, our um, intake of refugees to 25,000. I thought someone might say, well, let's increase it to 30,000. And the United Church Synod as a whole said, we should increase our refugee intake to 60,000 per year because it is 20% of our migration intake. I recently went to Sri Lanka um, and I went to those areas that are restricted and I saw the conditions from which people were fleeing and I met some young men who told me the same stories as the young men that I'd spoken to here at Christmas Island and also at Yonga Hill. They'd been picked up by the military, they'd had their photos taken, they'd been told, we know where you live. And they knew what that meant. This is the same story from the people who are on the ground in those highly militarised areas in Sri Lanka now, in Christmas Island and in Yonga Hill. Why do people get on a boat? They're not coming to Australia for a better life. They're leaving Sri Lanka to save their lives. There is no queue in Sri Lanka. There is no safe place for people to go. There's, if you could go to the Australian Embassy there, I don't know if it's on the map, um, there, there's no way to apply for asylum there. You have to find another country, to, uh, another country's embassy to try and get asylum in, in Sri Lanka. And this is shameful because people's lives are still in danger. There has been no full truth and reconciliation process there and the Methodist Church in Sri Lanka are calling for some of these injustices to be to be uh, redressed. So there's some of the some of the reflections that I have about your um, speech. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Julian. Um, I brought this along as a bit of a prop today uh, because it appeared in my um, letterbox, I think, yesterday. I forgot to get the mail yesterday. And, you know, Julian's right. In this um, lovely piece of information, the Liberal Party are saying, we will establish, re-establish rigorous offshore processing for illegal arrivals. So they're still using that terminology. And it's, uh, I don't have to talk to this audience. I don't think about everything that's wrong with this. But interestingly enough, I forgot to get the mail yesterday. When I pulled out the other mail, the snails, I don't know if you have snails that live in your little box, they eat most of it. And eat this. <laughs> I forgot that, what that actually says. <laughs> Just a couple of points, I think. Um, I probably would quibble with some of the, the details of, um, of, of, uh, of, uh, of Julian's uh, policy plan. I actually don't think people who haven't committed any crime should be detained for any time at all. But, you know, I accept that where we're at now, to get to, if we got to where Julian's talking about, so be it. Um, we've been fighting this campaign for 10 years. We could probably have a holiday for four weeks if we got there. Um, we're not going to take that holiday until we get there, though. The other point I wanted to make is one of the other aspects of this policy, when we talk about refugees, we sometimes, I think, seem, it seems like Australia doesn't actually exist on planet Earth. And these people are coming from somewhere to know Mars. We need to think about the other end of this problem, if you like. Um, uh, uh, Sri Lanka has been mentioned already. Make no mistake, when Julie Bishop and I think it was Scott Morrison yesterday or today talked about, oh, it's fine, it's okay, everything's fine in Sri Lanka. That's a nonsense. Sri Lanka is a police state. Let's not mess around here. It is a police state. And it's not just a police state for Tamils. If you're a journalist, in Sri Lanka that does something that journalists here don't do, i.e. ask intelligent questions about your government, <laughs> ask critical questions about your government, um, you'll end up in the back of a mysterious van that appears at your house. 
That is what Sri Lanka does. Make no mistake. And that's important because not only do we get refugees from Sri Lanka, Australia also plays footsie with this police state. They want to make, oh, you know, we can invest in Sri Lanka, it's a safe place. It's a safe place for Australian business, and that's about it. The same is the case in Afghanistan. We've had troops in Afghanistan for I don't know how long, years. It is still not safe. The Taliban still roams there, and now the Taliban roams in Pakistan too. You know, bombs go up in Quetta, week in, week out. This kind of stuff happens. We need to understand that if we're going to get up on a, on a high horse about refugees, we have to stop doing things like financing a police state in Sri Lanka, you know, trying to solve humanitarian problems by military means in Afghanistan, thinking about doing it again in Syria. You know, so I'm sorry, you, you provide humanitarian intervention by bombing people. You know, I'm going to be humane to you. I'm going to bomb you. I mean, it's ludicrous. We need to think about our foreign policy as well. Um, and I'd, I'd like to mention that there was talk about uh, human rights there. If a section of the community has a set of human rights that another section doesn't, that's actually not human rights. That's called privilege. And I think that's what we have to realise. What is being established, has already been established in Australia right now, is, a, is privilege. We have a privilege that we don't grant to asylum seekers. You know, we're going to, the, the Liberal Party are going to take away their right to actually have representation when they face tribunals. That's outrageous. So, you know, not only are we going to lock them up without charge or trial, if you actually ever get to face any kind of uh, refugee review tribunal or anything such thing, you won't have any backup. You won't have someone sitting next to you that can advise you on the law. This is insane. This is ripping people's human rights away from them. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, well, not for that. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about, just picking up from some of the things Julia talked about, to put this into a, an international and regional framework. We're looking at the number of people displaced. As, as Julian said, we're looking at more people displaced today than 19, I think, since 1994. Every day there are 23,000 people displaced, and we had 20,000 come in the last year. So you do have to put these things into a, a global framework. I think that um, there have been, I'm, I'm trying to think of some positive things that may have happened in terms of looking at safe, effective, and legal. No, that there was some money put toward trying to increase the humanitarian program in the last year. There was there was money put toward UNHCR in Indonesia. So the processing times were down from I know you spoke about 19 to 20 years. They were they were coming down to about 18 months to two years. But it's difficult still to remain in a place like Indonesia or a place like Pakistan or Malaysia if it's not safe. So more money needs to be going into looking at development issues to trying to work with non-government organisations in those areas to try to support refugees and asylum seekers in those areas so that they can wait safely for that period of time, for the 18 months to two years. Again, while that was a recommendation that came out last year from the expert panel, not enough money was put toward it, not enough time was, was, was spent in trying to talk to governments in the region. Um, we have gone in and tried to tell people how they should be doing this instead of working with other countries in the region to try to come up with a humane, a humane idea, a way of, of, of dealing with, I don't want to say issue uh, or problem, I want to say a humanitarian concern that we all should share and we should be looking at this in terms of a, a regional responsibility to look to, try to, we've talked about human rights, to try to work with those other communities to get them to sign the Refugees Convention. We are the only country in the region that has signed the Refugees Convention and I'm appalled to think that in the last year, I never thought it would happen that we start talking about withdrawal from the Refugees Convention. And, it, and I, it, it's a real shame to think that possibly in the next year, if we have a change in government, that that is going to happen. That we may look to withdraw from those international obligations instead of standing up within the region and saying this, this is the way we should go. And as, as you talked about, we're not setting a fantastic example. 
So I think I'm, I'm sure that lots of you have questions and, and issues you want to raise. So I'll, I'll stop there. And I didn't express myself very well before. Um, the, in, in, in Indonesia, it's true that the processing time for UNHCR is reducing. It's not the processing time I'm concerned about, it's resettlement. The point about refugee movement is not processing, it's resettlement. They want to get to somewhere safe where they can live. Um, I don't care if they're processed on the moon, to be honest. You know, as long as they are processed and swiftly resettled once they're accepted as refugees. The, the resettlement time in Indonesia at the moment is upwards of 20 years, and that's why people get on boats. They know they're refugees, they may well have a UNHCR refugee ticket in their pocket, but they're not resettled until someone offers to take them, or they take their life into their hands. That's why boat people come here, to get resettled. That's the point. And who of us wouldn't do the same? The last five years, we've welcomed the, in, in the city of Bayswater at uh, every uh, citizenship ceremony over five years. What we said in our welcome tonight that life is precious and everyone is special, and uh, we, I still stand by that. I was at a meeting the other night, and uh, a, a fellow from America, a very distinguished fellow, who doesn't know the history of Australia, he said that uh, Kevin Rudd is re-engaging the bad days of the white Australia policy because of the boat people. I really sympathise with the boat people because, like I said, life is precious. But I do like to question two of your remarks in your speech. Uh, sorry. And one was, I disagree that these are not the first peoples that the government parties in Australia has been cruel to. I'm a grandson of the ones that used to be, have steel chains around their necks and ankles marching around in the Kimberley in over 50 degree heat. The other thing is, you said $3 billion a year mistreating boat people. Well, we're still being mistreated today. So how many $3 billion dollars a year would that add up to? Thank you very much. Um, I completely agree with your comments. Um, what I said, and perhaps I didn't make it clear, was that as far as I know, this is the first time in Australian history where both major parties have been promising to outdo each other in cruelty. I, our treatment of Aborigines has been appalling from first to last, but I don't remember any government and opposition trying to outbid each other in their promises to be nastier to Aborigines. They just sort of been nasty as matter of habit. But they haven't been out there promising, making it, making it a bragging point, you know what I mean? And that's the difference. Uh, but I, I, you know, we can learn a hell of a lot from the Aborigines. Um, um, we should, not from the Well, right, it's the ground you walk on. Yeah, absolutely. And, but there's no party, no political party yet, that's uh, said a word against the treatment. Yeah, that there's one little exception. There's one little exception to that, which is of course at the first sitting of uh, Kevin Rudd's first parliament, uh, he did apologise to the Stolen Generations. Interestingly, I did the first Stolen Generations case that ended with a win. That was Bruce Trevorrow in Adelaide, and um, his brothers, who hadn't been stolen, uh, had become leaders of the Nigerian community in South Australia. They were invited to Canberra to be in Parliament House when the apology was given, but the government forgot to invite Bruce. <laughs> the only bloke has actually got a verdict from a court saying that he was stolen unlawfully and given damages to the population. But, you know, our treatment of the average has been shameful, it continues to be shameful, and the interesting thing is, the most, uh, uh, most striking and sudden and largest arrival rate of uninvited people by vote happened on the 26th of January, 1788. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Julian, thanks very much for your talk and thanks for all the advocacy work you've done 
over all the years. It's, you know, you've done some fantastic work that I really applaud. Um, I just wanted to question you about your last point, which is that refugees should be resettled in rural areas. Um, whilst I acknowledge that it would be a boon to rural areas to have refugees resettled there, uh, the same could be said for you or me uh, as having great skills and, and uh, good incomes. If we went there, we'd be a boon to those communities too. Uh, and same for pensioners or people who are, are on all sorts of government payments. We don't ask the people to do that in Australia because, you know, they have family commitments, they have friends, they have services that are in the cities that they want to access. I'd just like to know why you think that refugees are, are, are separate and different to the rest of Australians. No, fair, fair question. I'll obviously not explain that for bad it's only pending refugee status determination that I would say it's a condition of their visa that they live in rural or regional areas. And that's the practical reason that A, I think it would be beneficial for the country, B, I think it would take the pressure out of the, uh, especially Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, who, where the political concern about both people seems to come. But once they're, dis once they're determined to be refugees, I would say absolutely they live wherever they want to live. Um, so it's just a condition of a visa pending refugee status determination because in that interim period they don't have any absolute right to stay here. Yeah. You know, if they're assessed as refugees, of course they're entitled to stay. Up till then, it's all provisional. And that's why, and I thought about this with some care, uh, that's why I think it is not unreasonable to have that additional condition on their visa. I accept that there are other arguments, but I certainly would not advocate saying that because you're a refugee you've got to stay there all your life. Mm. For example, I wouldn't say that for a minute. Sorry, just uh, to check. Uh, it's not without precedent. That's that's the uh, important thing. Uh, it, like I joke about it, but it's true. The visa I'm on, it's called Visa 475B. Uh, I don't know after last year when they changed the names of the visas, what the current title is, but it is a regional state-sponsored visa. And what it does is, it says that you can live in Australia, but you have to spend two years in regional. Australia, so like in, uh, in regional WA or region of Queensland or where, whichever state sponsors you. And the benefit of that has been that uh, communities which, like for example in Northern, uh, my wife works there which is why I'm there and she's a psychologist. Um, there have been job openings for psychologists for a significant amount of time which no one was willing to take. Because you can take that job or you can take a job in Perth and live in Perth and get you know paid the same amount of money. Um, so I do think that it does help and it, it really has made a difference. We moved into town, we're renting in town, we buy regularly from, I mean, the Woolies basically might as well have direct deposit from my wife's account at this point. Um, it does benefit the small towns. Um, I do think it's a good idea that, you know, for two years, it, beyond just the economic benefit also, there's also another benefit, which is that um, rural areas do have um, a, a cliche and a, steer, a stereotype about them, that they are racist and things like that. It's a terrible stereotype. I live there, I've never experienced racism. But I do think that there are people who need wider exposure to people from outside Australia. And I think having someone re re you know, settle there for two years, do a two year period where they work, um, will benefit the town culturally. And the third thing is that the farmers actually desperately need farm hands. Um, it's a fact, most of the people I know in town are farmers. Nobody's willing to work for them because nobody's willing to live in town. Um, and the farms are dying as a result of it. And this is, at the, at the end of the day, for example, the wheat belt, a major part of the backbone of WA comes from that area. Um, and so, yes, if you, if you have people working on those farms as a part of the community, making friends, being involved, it's going to make a huge difference. I think not just to the refugees, but also to the community itself. on um, the silence of our new uh, Minister for International Development, Melissa Park, who previously was um, comes from a UN human rights background, she's, UN, she was a, she's a lawyer, and also um, has advocated for a regional solution quite heavily, but haven't been in the past, and now has been obviously quite silent. So I'd like to know what you all think of that. I have to choose my words reasonably carefully, I guess. <laughs> Who was the Fremantle candidates debate the other night? I know Jordan was because he won. But was, anybody, <laughs> uh, was anybody else? Okay, reason, reasonable show of hands. 
the thing about the Labour Party and the strange thing that holds, you know, like I've often compared it to three really angry cats in a sack fighting each other and the sack's kind of lumpy and it's changing shape and you can never tell which of its different components are in the ascendant at any different time but you just know that they really dislike each other. But the thing is, once a decision falls out, they're all bound to it. And that's the saddest thing about it is that I, you know, I can understand I guess if you go into that party as a bit of a racist target, it's not necessarily going to change you, but someone who does go into it as a human rights lawyer who's seen this stuff up actually much closer than I have. She's been in a war. Uh, and then fall out and uh, accept the policy. Caucus Solidarity will insist that she votes for it. Um, but then show up at a public forum and go, please don't hurt me, I don't really believe in what we're doing. It's actually sure. crap. It's self <laughs>
to, to tell their, their stories and make them doubly and triply vulnerable because then they have to confront their own trauma as well as, as, well as have, then gaining a public face. We actually, we actually see those stories sink without a trace. People are moved by it immediately, but it sinks without a trace because of this ongoing media machine that next seems to seems to need to to victimise the most vulnerable people, as Julian's already referred to, in in any community, and whether it is Aboriginal people, which we who we who we also seem to be able to characterise in this in this way, or whether it's refugee people, or whether it's people with mental health. We can't hold that story. But recently we've been making some, some strides. And so I think that that does hold out some hope for us. And I think that it, uh, reading these polls is not like reading the news poll because some of the questions are framed in a more intelligent and uh, uh, framed with more integrity, uh, in, uh, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I, I, I take a question on board for sure. I think one thing we do have to remember is that the likes of this mob have astronomically more resources than we have. I can't ring up the West Australian or anybody else and get my head on telly. Uh, Kevin Rudd, Tony Abbott can, they can produce this kind of lovely glossy stuff. Go out to the refugee rights store, it's all photocopied. <laughs> Scott's photocopy. Um, so we do have to realise that we're really punching above our weight. But I do think there is hope. One of the, one of the things we're trying to do, particularly in the Refugee Rights Action Network, we're, 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 we, we hope very, very much that Scott gets back into the Senate. But we know the Greens aren't going to form government, you know, come September. That's not going to happen. It's basically either going to be the choice between Tony Abbott and Kevin Rudd. And it probably looks like Tony Abbott, to be honest with you. But we have a plan. And that is basically, we don't accept that power always comes from Canberra. We all are in organisations around the place. The churches, I'm in the National Tertiary Education Union, I'm sure other people are. We have to think of ways we can use these organisations to wield social power. One of the things we want to do in Refugee Rights Action Network is penetrate into the unions. We've already made a start with the National Tertiary Education Union. We want these unions to stand up and say, no, we don't agree with this. The ACTU have already done it. They need to go further, we need to push them further. We want to see bans on deportations. We want to see the transport workers say, if you put someone on a Qantas flight to send them back, we're not refueling it. We want to see that one stuff. <laughs> go to Nauru. This is how we actually wield our social power. Because remember, we're the ones who are powerful. It is a trick when Kevin Rudd tells us that he's the one who's powerful, or Tony Abbott. We build the stuff. We wield the votes. Everything that they have, we gave to them. And we can take it away, and we should take it away, unless they change this policy. <laughs> started something up here with your question so much so that I wanted to quickly have a second go. Um, we printed up, I think, something in the order of half a million how to vote cards and on the 7th, next, this time next week, uh, we need to have them in every school in the state. Uh, we are organising the largest mobilisation of volunteers that we've ever done as a political party before. Every single one of those pieces of paper has Care for Refugees message on it. If you, and in terms of preaching to the unconverted, we've got to win 220,000 votes from Saturday. If you can give us a hand to distribute those pieces of paper to the far one corners of this city and this state, that's how we're going to reach the unconverted. I just thought of it. My previous answer was actually not all that practical. This one, <laughs> this one, this one is as practical as I can think of at the moment. Um, we have to actually push back and show these parties that it cost them votes. You know that it was a dead end. It was a blind alley. It was a mistake. Uh, and that they strengthened the hand of people who were speaking out against it. Saturday's the best chance we got for doing that. I, I think one of the big problems with the conversation, of course, is that you've got to get the Murdoch press uh, as the intermediary, <laughs> getting them to talk to the camera for us. And that's really a fairly forlorn hope. I live in hope that Murdoch's going to sort of back my phone or something like that. Hack my mobile, that'd be good. <laughs>
<laughs> um, but the, the, there is a way of sending a message next week, in addition to what Scott said. I mean, clearly, I think voting green in the Senate is essential for all sorts of reasons. But um, I, I, I reckon in any other, like, in a lower house, whatever electorate you're in, vote greens, and then vote for whichever party does not hold that seat at the moment. Now, it doesn't matter which of the, the, the two are indistinguishable anyway. But the point is it will send a message to both parties, both major parties, both old parties, use the new jargon. Um, it will send a message to both of them that people are unhappy. Now, you know, of course the Green Party takes government, but you can send a powerful message up the line, short of, you know, picketing the docks and, and uh, blocking construction, which is a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and not refueling the promise, mate. But you will send this. The, the one exception to that, if, if, and there's no one here who lives in Scott Morrison's um, electorate, but I'd say definitely vote against him. <laughs> you, really, you really shouldn't get that. Uh, everyone should vote against Scott Morrison. But you know, if you want to send a message to Canberra, next Saturday is the, the big chance that our system provides. Uh, even Murdoch can't get away that. Hi everyone, um, I have two questions, but just before I do that, I'd like to thank Julian for naming the heart of what's going on here, which is, in my opinion, the mutilation of the Australian character and the, the loss of our soul, the maiming of our soul as a country. And I don't think, unless we name that, that we can start to deal with it. So thank you. You've written about this before, and as somebody who's 18, and will have to to be part of the movement that tries to heal this country when we can look ourselves in the mirror and, and, and see what we've done. Thank you for at least being a voice along with Scott and others in this wilderness to actually say this is wrong. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> One very direct, one perhaps less so. It seems to me that there is a fundamental problem within the Department of Immigration. It seems that the people in there have lost touch with reality, the policies they seem to keep suggesting to, to their ministers get worse and worse over time, and Fraser has even spoken about this from when he was Prime Minister. So I'm wondering to the whole panel what can be done to reform them. Is that really where the problem lies? And secondly, I was part of the uh, Fremantle candidate forum a few days ago, and my Liberal colleague, um, for want of a better word, uh, said that the that asylum seekers were in fact illegal uh, because the coalition policy said they were, even when the rules told him otherwise. And so I wonder how you feel, Julian, as a man of the law, when a person like that in that position and society as general, in general disregard a statement that something is factually legal uh, and, and, and almost treats it as though it's a lefty slogan. And how do you counteract that? Well, I'm not sure how you, um, <coughs> how you meant that sort of stupidity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a sort of Humpty Dumpty principle of language, you know, where it means uh, what I say it means. Um, well, it's illegal because our policy says it's illegal. I mean, it's just patchwork. It's almost laughable. It wasn't so serious. Um, and I think all you can do is simply keep calling an out on it and saying, well, that's a lie. Um, point to the section that makes it illegal. Point to any offence that they've committed. They can't do that. I mean, I, someone I know in Sydney has been writing Scott Morrison's electoral office for some while now on this very point and getting increasingly stupid answers. Um, in fact, there's something else. If you really want to get it off your chest, write to your local, whoever is your elected uh, the coalition representative, write to them and, um, and ask them that question. Do they think both people are really? <coughs> if so, can they identify what offence they commit? And when you get back the sort of two pages of guff from staff, and write back to them and say, I understand there is an election coming up quite soon. I'm in your electorate. Would you mind answering the question I asked you? And, and chase them down. They will never be able to. Now, if enough people do that to enough 
coalition and Labour, well, especially coalition uh, MPs, the message will gradually get through. I know it's not quite the sort of conversation you want to have, but you know it's it's another it's another line. Um, as for your first point, um, my experience is, and, and I think others will probably have better um, knowledge on this than I do. But the department, I think, does what the government's current policy dictates. They they swing with the breeze and they do as the public service is supposed to. I guess they do what their political parties <coughs> want. You know, during the couple of years after the middle of '08, when um, Chris Evans introduced it sweeping changes, all of a sudden the department was actually quite good. Their attitudes were good, the people were nice, like they cared, and then suddenly the caring all disappeared. And in that uh, haunting phrase of Abishai Margley, you suddenly saw compassion and harm to vindictiveness again. Um, yeah, just a few comments on issues around department integration. I think what you're saying is, is, is true. I think um, now, there are other countries where they take refugee status determination away from the, the political and have independent decision makers. Um, if you look at the way the Department of Immigration have to make decisions and the circumstances in which they have to make them, it's very difficult. If you're, if you're doing applications for a refugee status in detention centres and migration agents are having to do three applications a day and difficulties with interpreters, Mistakes can and will be made by decision makers, apart from the legal pressures that are placed on them by um, those above them. So they operate in quite difficult circumstances. The increase in numbers of people arriving means you've got inexperienced decision makers coming in. And these are all problems um, that the department has faced. And with the current, or the, or the current policy of the opposition to move in and say, well, we're going to abolish review, it's going to be an absolute disaster because at least now, I mean the decision of acceptance rate of refugees at first instance is probably around 60 to 70 percent. Once you go to review, it turns more up to, to 90 percent. So but without that ability to have review, it's going to be extremely, what's going to be terrible. I've got a bit of thing I've got to do. I do want to say about the uh, about the department. It just it's the policies that are, are the problem, according to me. And I do want to tell you that a few weeks ago, you'll remember there was a boat tragedy, another boat tragedy, and there was a little three-year-old child who who drowned, and his father was here in Western Australia, and his mother was. In, in, taken back to Indonesia and she was uh, sleeping under the tree outside the hospital and he was, the father was here and distraught and he had the papers that identified the child and the child couldn't be given a name or given to anybody in Indonesia because there was no identification papers because they went uh, in the ocean as well as the people. And the Department of Immigration people were very, very rapid. When I asked them to assist, they assisted immediately. They were compassionate and caring <coughs> and appropriate. And I do think it, it is a credit to them. And we, we often can't say the good things that they do because, you know, they can't be doing good things. Um, that are, uh, are counter to the to the public policy, and uh, I know that a lot of people hang in that department, trying to um, bring some kind of humanity and human face to the awful policies that we've had. Here's a bit of gossip, totally unrelated to your question. Well, nearly totally unrelated to your question. There is an Australian woman at the moment who's living on an Australian naval vessel, which is uh, anchored just off Manus Island. She is shuttled to and from Manus Island every day. Her, her role, her employed role, is to teach uh, Papua New Guineans how to uh, determine a person's refugee status. They will be doing, Papua New Guineans will do refugee status determination under the Papua New Guinea arrangement that Rudd entered. I met this woman's daughter at a meeting in Melbourne last week. 
This woman left school at 15 and became a hairdresser. She spent 20 years being a hairdresser, then she retired and stayed out of the workforce for the next 15 or 20 years. And then she decided, when her kids were off her hands, that she would go back into the workforce. She got a low-level job in the immigration department. And a year later, she is now the chief trainer of PNG natives who will be doing refugee states of determination. Even she is frightened by the fact that she has no idea how to teach them. I mean, the, we're, we're, we're generating a, actually it'll be an interesting piece of litigation. <laughs> won't let it go. But it, it tells you something. I mean, that's a very nasty decision by someone in the department who thinks, look, the government just wants to send all these people back. So we'll make sure the state of determination is, is hopeless. And of course, Scott Morrison has announced overnight that uh, uh, they're not going to allow IAAAS um, representation uh, at government expense. So most people will now front uh, their state of determination without help. Uh, they said they've said they'll abolish the refugee review tribunal. So one department officer will sit in review of another department officer. Again, a recipe for bad decision making and decision making of the sort of government wants. Yeah, one more. I think we have time for one more. One more question. Yes. Oh, Julian, um, I uh, I share your view about Australia being a better place if it's multicultural. I also have in common with you the same characteristic that uh, the way that I enact that is that I have refugees in my home, and just here is come to my home today, um, and I've had refugees before uh, in my home. And um, But I'm particularly concerned about uh, what can be done, given what you said exactly about uh, the lack of the future, if Scott Morrison gets this way, the future lack of legal representation and then the withdrawing of right of review. I'm particularly keen to support the people who come to me but with, I mean, maybe this is a selfish motivation on my part, but I like to back winners. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I'm wondering what you as a lawyer can advise or what you think is the future, given what you've just said, because it would be terrible for, you know, worthy people to be, uh, who should be able to become Australians, um, to be sent back and, uh, you know, just a dreadful waste of energy for, you know, for the, for all this to happen to these people. So as a lawyer, where to from here, given that probably Scott Morrison is going to be calling the tune after next Saturday with regard to these issues? Uh, well, I, I, I don't want to overreach, uh, but I suspect that however they try to do it will be open to legal challenge. I, to be candid, I'm not sure that I like the idea of using litigation as an instrument of, of um, a policy setting. Um, but if, if, if you can't get your message through and if good conscience can't prevail, well then using the law I guess is a, a final resort. But I think there are some probably constitutional difficulties in denying people access to a fair process by denying them the possibility of uh, understanding what's going on. Um, you know, it, it actually brings to mind, I've spent the last uh, month or so pretty heavily engaged in a um, thing for James Hurd. And I suddenly, it suddenly occurred to me, there's a striking parallel between the AFL and the way Australia is behaving. They both think they rule the roost, they both think they're more important than anyone, they both think they're on God's right hand, they both think they're all powerful, they both think they can do whatever they want. And the idea of giving someone a fair go doesn't seem to occur to them. I think that comes back to our point about losing our national character. Bullying seems to be part of our national character now. I think we ought to take steps to try and combat it wherever we can. And this is a matter of social attitudes. No, no litigation is ever going to achieve that. I mean, occasionally in litigation you can call out a bully and, and show them up for what they are. But I think we need to be very astute to the fact that our country is now behaving like a very ugly bully. And this, this idea that we'll, they'll deny them the opportunity of being represented competently is just another aspect of that bullying. You know, you sort of get the most vulnerable people in the world, kick them when they're down, and then throw them out again. That's horrible. That's not what we should be doing. I don't think litigation can help all of it, but maybe some can. Is there a basis for it, though? Oh, it's just a, matter, matter, of, just a matter of legislation. You know, we, we provide uh, government-funded IAAS support. Um, 
But of course, this is not aimed. This is not aimed at the individual migration agents who travel on and help out on a roster basis in the detention centres. This is aimed at mobs like Rilke in Melbourne, who run successful challenges, including the Malaysian uh, uh, solution challenge. Um, and I think Scott Morrison would love to knock uh, David Mann out of the ring because he will be a thorn in their side. And um, you know, if they have, if they get their way. And if we can't combat what they do with effective litigation, then I reckon everyone in this room and everyone across the country ought to chip in a couple of bucks to make sure that mobs like that can keep going. And let me say, I say that I don't charge anything for refugee litigation, so I'm not, I don't have skin in the game, if you know what I mean. I'm not arguing out of self-interest, but I would hate it if real lost their funding and couldn't operate as effectively as they have done. Thank you. Us. You know, we, we're not going to take this on. 
so I think the main thing is just to maintain hope and also maintain a degree of rage that we are not just going to settle for what's getting served up in our name. If you don't like what gets served up in Parliament House, get people in there to replace them. You know, we have agency in our system. I have it on reasonably good authority uh, that Julian doesn't mind the occasional drop of single malt scotch from Japan. <laughs> and so it happens that we have a bottle up here with us in a bag that says, I'm on the case, because of how much she is on the case. Can you please thank Julian for coming all the way? One point that you made over there about people, about reaching out to right, the right people and everything. Um, I've been doing the, the, that comedy thing I did for you. Uh, I've been doing that around us, like WA. I've been in like Kalgoorlie and, and Jerkin and these places. I went to Jerkin a week after the boat landed there. And I've never, and every time I perform that, you know the parts where you applaud it, that's the same part where everyone applauds. So I, on it, and it's, I don't think it's because I'm that funny, because I know that. I know it's because sometimes you connect with people about the truth. And I think that's all that's happening is that the truth is not being conveyed. So it's up to you now to spread that. Thank you and enjoy your dinner. Thank you.